Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, this evening for what I'm sure will be an interesting session on physical exercise and peripheral neuropathy. My name is Nancy Froman, and I'm with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Tanya Zivin, and we are pleased to be here and to learn with you all on this very important subject. But before we start, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, the first thing to note is that the presentation is being recorded. You will be emailed a link to the recording so you can view it again at your leisure, uh, probably in the next couple of days. Um, secondly, if you have any questions anytime during the presentation, we will try to answer them. At the end of the webinar, you'll see a question box in the left hand of your screen to go ahead and type your questions in there. I will ask you to keep them on topic to this webinar and uh, very general, not to your specific situation. We, and um, we will try to get uh, your questions answered as many as we can. Um, the final thing to note is that if you're having trouble with the audio during the presentation, you can go back to your registration email that was sent to you and there is a phone number that you can dial in. Um, so now to start our presentation, I wanted to I want to introduce Sarah Boyd. Sarah has a doctorate in physical therapy from the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences. She currently works as a physical therapist with the Neurological Disease Rehabilitation Clinic at Mayo. She specializes in working with individuals diagnosed with ALS, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, muscular dystrophy, peripheral neuropathy, and other diagnoses. She's committed her career in both clinical practice and clinical education to the benefits of rehabilitation for various disorders, and she has a passion to collaborate and brainstorm with her patients on ways to maximize their movement potential, their safety, and their own independence. And now I will turn this over to Sarah to um, give us her view and, and her expertise on physical exercise with peripheral neuropathy. Well, thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful introduction. I am very excited and honored to be here. I have collaborated with the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy kind of over this past year with development of different newsletters on varying topics of living well um, in the setting of peripheral neuropathy. And those are all located on their webpage. And we decided to be a great idea to go virtual. So the focus of my discussion is exercise and really giving some practical tips and tricks to navigate around obstacles that peripheral neuropathy can bring and hopefully provide you some exercises that you can start today, especially as the coronavirus pandemic has really impacted all of our goals of starting or sticking with a program. So I'll advance the slide. I have no disclosures. For today, what I hope that you will learn is identifying different key benefits of physical exercise specifically for peripheral neuropathy. Hopefully by the end of our discussion, you will identify different factors that might impact your ability to exercise and how to maximize your success with different strategies. And then lastly, I hope to provide two different exercises to address a well-rounded exercise program consisting of strength, flexibility, balance, aerobic, and a core exercise. Before we get into the nitty gritty, we just want to poll you guys and see where everyone falls on how exercise is going, and what they're currently doing. So 
if everyone could answer the poll of where do you currently exercise, we will give about 45 seconds to answer. And we just like to know if you're currently exercising at a gym, at home, outside, or if none of the above as you don't exercise at this time. And we'll give about 10 more seconds before we'll close this poll. Okay, we'll see the results. Okay, look at everyone exercising at home. That's amazing. And for those taking advantage of the great outdoors and also starting to pursue gyms as they're reopening. And so for those 8% of those who don't exercise, I hope that this uh, webinar provides you some insight to start. And we'll go to the next poll. So the next question that we would like to know is in your current exercise routine, do you currently work with a physical therapist or a personal trainer? Or you had worked with a physical therapist or a personal trainer in the past? If you're only just using your home equipment or none of the above? And we'll give about 10 more seconds again before we move to the next poll. Okay, we'll see the results. Okay, so a good majority of you all had worked with a physical therapist or personal trainer in the past and using home gym equipment. And 19% currently work with a physical therapist or a personal trainer. Great. So then our last poll is asking what are you most concerned about when you're increasing your daily activity and your exercise? Do you find that you're most concerned about pain, safety, or just the general, I don't really know what I should be doing that's right for me? And we'll have 10 more seconds before we see the results. Okay, let's go and see what everyone said. So we're kind of pretty well even across the board with each of those answers with pain, safety, and unsure of what I should do kind of all coming in at around the same percentages. Thank you all for answering those. So now we'll get to more of the nitty gritty of our discussion. So bringing it back to the goals and objectives of our webinar, the first goal was really to identify key benefits of physical exercise for individuals living with peripheral neuropathy. 
So ultimately, why should we exercise? We all know why we should exercise and that the benefits of exercise is all encompassing. You know, it reduces the risk of chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, dementia, cancers, to also exercise helping with your sleep hygiene. These benefits really can see, be seen in anyone who decides to put on their tennis shoes and engage in a regular exercise program. But you might be still asking, you know, what are the benefits to exercise if I'm living with a peripheral neuropathy? Are there other benefits to me specifically? When you perform a review of the literature, you're gonna find all of these studies just coming up, looking at the benefits of exercise in peripheral neuropathy. Now, a majority of the literature is limited to more diabetic peripheral neuropathy or chemo-induced peripheral neuropathies, but really we can take this information and use it to answer the overarching question of what do all of these research articles mean for me? Even if your peripheral neuropathy is from a different cause or more of a hereditary or genetic cause, exercise is still gonna be so helpful and what we learn from different articles can still be generalized to you. So after reviewing the exercise, really the big main highlights that I want you all to take away from is exercise really helps in pain control. So some of you have had identified that you are concerned about pain being a limiting factor when you are starting to engage in more of a regular activity program or just your daily activities. But truly motion is lotion. And as you start to move more, your pain can get better, especially more of that neuropathic pain. And this is really looking at the pathophysiology of what is occurring as we're exercising. You know, exercise really targets both the central and your peripheral nerve locations that are involved in pain. And studies really have found that there's all these special molecular and cellular changes that can help with nerve health. There's also signs that we have our own kind of built in pain, um, pain modulating system with more endogenous opioids in our nervous system being released that helps with pain management and reduction. And another area that exercise targets is really our inflammatory system. When there is an injury in an area or after anyone exercises, there's a brief moment of more inflammation. And when we have more inflammation in our system, all of these special cells come to the area of injury or inflammation, and that can increase pain. Well, exercise can really help reduce inflammation and really support more of the release of these anti-inflammatory cells and markers, which really can help reduce your pain. Other things that exercise can be really helpful for, specifically for peripheral neuropathies, is your nerve health and preservation. Um, unfortunately, sometimes what is done to the nerve is done, but what we can continue to encourage is maintenance of that nerve health so it doesn't get worse. And studies truly have shown that exercise can help delay onset of different neuropathies or increase that neural communication, velocities of how those nerves are communicating with each other. So can really alter or delay courses of peripheral neuropathies by staying active on a regular basis. Other studies have looked at individuals who have more of a chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy and found that they have less symptoms and functional limitations such as reduced difficulty in standing or walking. They have less weakness or muscular cramps compared to those who were inactive. And of course, as you're moving throughout your environment and you're encouraging maintenance of your strength, endurance, and your flexibility, this can truly help reduce your fear of falling as well as improving your fatigue. 
Studies have also shown that exercise helps improve your mobility. So your walking speed, your unsteadiness, how you take a turn, all of that can improve with more of a regular exercise program. And as we see the positive impact of exercise for individuals living with peripheral neuropathy, there's still a concern over your foot and your skin health. You know, I have a lot of clients who indicate, well, I was told I shouldn't be doing weight bearing tasks because of my skin or my foot health concerns. And we know that peripheral neuropathy increases your risk of skin breakdown or possible joint deformities, which could be further exacerbated pending the severity of any sensory or circulation impairments. So you could hear all of these improvements and still think, well, once again, I've heard I should limit my weight bearing. But of course you should seek your medical clearance by your primary care provider if you have greater risk factors. But ultimately evidence really shows that it's safe and feasible to perform weight bearing tasks. And this is primarily more in individuals who have diabetic peripheral neuropathies for this topic specifically. But once again, we can transfer this evidence over to other peripheral neuropathies who share similar features, signs, and concerns. And if you have obtained clearance from your medical provider, then just remember you gotta check your feet daily, frequently, and once again, throughout the day not just after you exercise. So using that handheld mirror to look at your toes, in between your toes, around your heel, your arches, and just making sure that there's no signs of irritation, redness, maybe a wound is already starting to develop, or pressure. Um, so if you do start to experience any type of skin reaction, then yes, we want you to maybe reduce that activity that caused it or seek your medical care provider's opinion. And if you are experiencing more of an open sore or a foot injury, then it is recommended to do more non-weight bearing tasks. So transitioning into our next objective is identifying different factors that would impact your ability to exercise and hopefully giving you some strategies to maximize your success. So you're hearing all these positive influences of exercises and all the whys and the, the why you should do it. And you might be thinking, you know, that's great and all, but how do I exercise? And how do I exercise if I'm experiencing neuropathic pain or if I'm having more weakness and fatigue one day? Or how do I exercise if I'm concerned about falling? And then, of course, we got to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the coronavirus. You know, how do I exercise now that I have this novel pandemic really impact my ability to exercise because my gym closed or all of the online options or home equipment got too expensive for me to actually carry out. So we'll start with more of the neuropathic pain being an impact or a more of a limiting factor for exercising. So we talked about how exercise has all these additive effects in pain management. It's really helpful for reducing your nerve sensitivity, encouraging our own built-in pain relieving hormones and systems to reduce aspects of nerve pain. But that does not really tell us how we can exercise when you are in pain. You know, here, when we're thinking about neuropathic pain, it does require a multidisciplinary approach. Exercise alone isn't as efficacious in reducing nerve pain. You have to have more of a combination approach, and that is through medication or other pharmacologic interventions, and that will be all coordinated with your primary care team. But nerves also really like movement, nerves like space, nerves like blood flow, like circulation. And so when you pair the two together and if it's starting to work, your tolerance to activity 
will improve. It might not completely take away your nerve pain, but it might make it more manageable to where you say, I can success successfully go through my day. And biggest food for thought is studies have shown individuals who do not exercise actually have an increased risk of developing neuropathic pain. And individuals who do exercise actually have been found that there's no significant increase in your neuropathic pain. And that was more so in individuals with diabetic peripheral neuropathies. But once again, neuropathic pain is something that is common in many types of peripheral neuropathies. So we can also apply that to other individuals and say, it is safe to exercise. We're not gonna cause an increase in your nerve pain. So how do I navigate through neuropathic pain? Different options to help improve your overall tolerance to movement is you can incorporate more of a TENS unit and that is the bottom picture on the right where you have sticky electrodes and you put them around the area of discomfort or where you're having more pain and it provides a very comfortable buzzing sensation. And studies show very low evidence as to if this really does help, but doesn't mean don't knock until you try it. So you can encourage use of the TENS unit uh, as guided by a physical therapist who trains you appropriately in its use and see if that could be really helpful in your ability to exercise because you can use the TENS unit with movement at the same time. Other options that you can do to address nerve pain to help maximize your participation in your exercise program is using a topical treatment, whether that's a lidocaine patch or more of an ointment that can encourage a reduction in pain. Other options is to warm up. Uh, evidence has shown even using a contrast bath can be helpful for improving blood flow to your area of pain. It can also encourage that, that flexibility of those tissues. So a contrast bath is when you alternate between cold water and warm or hot water. And you usually have longer times in the hot water, like three minutes, and then you switch your limb over to the cold water and you only place your limb in the water for about 10 seconds to a minute. And you can do that up to 20 minutes, just kind of alternating between both of those baths. And I do have a little asterisk there to provide caution to contrast baths, especially if you do have more sensory impairments to temperature. You know, we don't want it scalding hot and we don't want it frigid cold. So you can kind of play around with the temperature um, that's safe for you. Other options to incorporate to help reduce nerve pain is deep breathing or other relaxation, relaxation methods and then reduce your irritating stimuli. If you're an individual who is having more discomfort with weight bearing that day, maybe perform just more non-weight bearing exercises, whether that's sitting or laying down. So you do not have that repetitive stress of stepping. And then remove your socks or shoes if you're non-weight bearing. Whenever you are standing, we want you to have supportive shoe wear and nice socks to help with sweat absorption, especially for that skin integrity and also for safety. So now when we approach the next barrier to exercise about weakness and fatigue, these two can really be addressed together as you're going to approach them similarly. So whenever we have weakness or fatigue, we like to approach our exercises in a submaximal manner. And the actual definition to submaximal exercise is when you're exercising at a heart rate less than 85% of your predicted maximal heart rate. So that 
in general is usually an unreliable marker of what is submaximal for you, especially in chronic conditions, or if you're taking any cardiovascular medications that are impacting your heart rate response. So the biggest thing about submaximal exercise principles is monitoring how you feel and it's letting your symptoms be your guide. And this is gonna be different between each and every single person. It's all individualized, but general principles to follow to apply submaximal exercise principles is perform exercise resistance with moderate resistance to just body weights. Other ideas are spreading exercises throughout the day instead of thinking I have to exercise for 30 to 45 minutes all at once. Doing little chunks throughout the day, such as three bouts of 10, 15 minute exercises is just as beneficial than if you did it all at once. And you could probably tolerate it so much better and have less adverse effects afterwards. And also using self-assessment tools to monitor intensity. And we'll go through them next. But the one thing I want to really emphasize is this whole concept of no pain, no gain. I got to exercise to this point of complete exhaustion and feel depleted does not apply in a peripheral neuropathy or if you're experiencing weakness and fatigue. We want you to feel revitalized after you exercise and we want you to feel good after you exercise. And how you can appropriately monitor while you're exercising is using these very easy self-administered tools. The first one being the Borg rating of perceived exertion scale. And then the next one being the talk test. So for the board rating of perceived exertion scale, it's you asking yourself, how much do I really feel like I am exercising? And we want you to be exercising in between this fairly light to somewhat hard range. Another option is using the talk test. When you are exercising, you should be working at a level where you can speak in full sentences, but cannot sing. And like I said, we want you to monitor your symptoms after exercising. If you are experiencing excessive fatigue, more pain like muscular soreness or cramping, or more muscular weakness or a functional change, that is all indicative that you're exercising too hard. So next time adjust your duration, intensity, or the resistance and repetition. Another area of concern that could be a barrier is navigating your falls risk when you're exercising. So the biggest thing is safety is key. And with the peripheral neuropathy, you are at more of a falls risk, but there are some different options to incorporate to reduce your falls risk, such as using a mobility device or hand support with a kitchen counter, wear supportive, properly fitting shoes, if you are an individual who wears an ankle foot orthosis or other type of leg brace, please use that when you are exercising for additional stability. Other options are thinking about your body positioning. As I'm performing an exercise, maybe I position myself the corner of a room with a chair or walker in the front of me, or I position myself in front of my bed or my couch. So if I do have a little more instability and have to quickly sit, it's a nice soft cushioned surface. Other options are requesting your family to supervise. And if you're still concerned, remain seated or perform ground exercises in the bed. So just because exercises say do it on the ground, you can easily just do that in your bed. So now about the white elephant in the room and that's the coronavirus pandemic. You know, this really has affected the entire world and really had a negative influence on how we can stay active. But that doesn't give us a, a scapegoat. That doesn't give us an out for exercise because the centers of, of disease and control and prevention, they still say you gotta get that 150 minutes 
of moderate intensity exercise a week and incorporate at least two days of strengthening. And for adults older than 65 years old, we do want you to also incorporate balance. So we'll go through several examples of each component to an exercise program coming up, especially ones that will be specific to you um, and to your needs. But first, let's not forget that activity does not really come in all sh shapes and sizes. Exercise can easily just be do what you do in a day. And that's summed up nicely in the phrase NEAT. And that's short for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So for individuals who say, I haven't really been exercising, you are exercising just by doing exactly what you're doing in a, in a day to day basis. And there's some different neat ideas that you can do to gradually encourage more activity throughout your day. You know, if you're able, park further from the store. So maybe park by one of the cart corrals, grab a cart and then you walk in or move during each commercial commercial break rather that um, whether that's maybe you just marching in place when you're sitting or just standing up and sitting down other things walk and talk if you're having a conversation with a family member or a friend grab bluetooth speakers or a speaker phone so it's all hands free and keeping you safe that's an easy way to kill two birds with one stone And if you are an individual who is starting to return back to the gym and feeling comfortable of returning to the gym, just remember there are strategies to make you safe and others safe. You know, some of the strategies are still wearing the cloth face mask, washing your hands frequently, or using hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol, disinfect equipment before and after use and still remain six feet away from each other. And the big thing is skip the locker room, just go home because that's just more time indoors that what you really need. And if you're an individual who had coronavirus, you know, we're really still trying to learn more about the impact of coronavirus on our health and more of these short and longer term symptoms. We know that it's a very systemic condition and each individual, once again, kind of presents very individually. Not everyone is coming in with a specific pattern of these longer ter term impairments. But the biggest thing is you got to still obtain clearance from your medical care team to make sure that you are safe to start exercising, especially if you have had more cardiac or pulmonary involvement. But in general, it's safe for you to start slowly and gradual, gradually try to increase in a very slow manner. Stop and follow, um, stop if you're, if you're starting to experience more chest pain, shortness of breath, fever, headache, excessive fatigue, or if you're having more heart rate fluctuations. So if you're experiencing any of those, then we would want you to consult with your medical team. And that is only in the setting that you had COVID and now you're returning back to exercise. So exercise, like we said, it's, it's something that's very multimodal. It needs to have a little bit of everything to be really beneficial. It needs to have components of strength. You need to have balance exercises, flexibility, aerobic, and also exercises to address your core. And I just have a little disclaimer above is just please consult with a healthcare provider before beginning a new program. So we'll go through some options of different exercises to in start incorporating into your day-to-day -day life right now. And the first, let's see. We're just having a little delay in the slide.
Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, I think we're live again. Okay, I'm able to move through the slides. So two exercises that you can start to perform right now is a sit to stand. This exercise is something that you should do in a very sturdy chair, one that does not have rollers. And the biggest thing is slow and controlled and really try to emphasize quality. So scooting closer to the edge of your chair as you stand, think nose over toes, because that's going to help out with standing. And immediately upon standing, find your balance. Stand tall, think hips under your shoulders, and then you slowly sit down. You can progress this exercise by changing the height of the surface. So a lower surface is going to be harder, or if you're just having a day that you just don't think the low surface is gonna work, do it from the edge of your bed or a taller surface. And then use a squishy surface for balance or your core. So put a pillow on the, the seat, because then that's a little bit more unstable it requires a little bit more postural control on your part. Another exercise to incorporate for strengthening is a bottom raise. So you're laying on the bed and if you feel comfortable, you can do that on the ground. But like I said, I just encourage doing it all on the bed. Bend your legs and then you're just going to raise your bottom up slowly lower. If you are experiencing more low back pain during this exercise, do not raise up as high. And if your hamstrings begin to cramp, which is the back of your thigh, just move your feet closer towards your bottom. Other options to increase the challenge of this exercise is squeezing a ball or a pillow between your knees as you're lifting and lowering your bottom, or you just hold the position as you keep your bottom elevated. Options for incorporating balance into your day. If you have coffee brewing or if you're waiting for water to boil as you're standing next to your kitchen counter, slowly take steps to the side. Try not leaning over. Don't slide the feet across the floor and really place each foot as softly as you can. That's going to offer a little bit more control and uh, challenge for you. And then adjust your hand support. Start with two hands. Then if you're feeling good with two hands, progress to one hand. Then progress to fingertip to hovering for more of a challenge. Another exercise to progress and work on your balance is more of an ankle sway. So knowing we all sway, that is a very normal thing in life to experience. It's what you do with the sway, that's what we need to practice. And so when you're standing next to your support surface, whether that's your kitchen counter or a table or a chair, I want you to find your center and that's really pressure or the weight at the ball of your foot. You might find, I'm actually putting a lot of weight at my heels or I'm more at my tippy toes. Try to recenter yourself and reorganize what your body interprets midline as. And then once you found your center, you're just going to slowly shift your weight towards your toes. And then you're gonna slowly shift your weight towards your heels. Try to keep the feet planted on the ground. It's not raising them up. It's all about control. You can progress your balance exercise by adjusting the hand support. And then also progressing from eyes open to eyes closed. Flexibility. Just like what we talked about nerves, they like movement, they like blood flow. And so one of the options that you can do is what's called a nerve floss. And that's when you're slowly moving a joint back and forth. And that's thought to help kind of guide these nerves along the different tissues and making them more flexible. So the first one is just gonna be sitting on a chair and you're gonna slouch, something that you never hear a physical therapist say. But as you slouch, then you're just going to straighten your knee and then bend your knee. You're just going to do that continuously, straightening and bending, not fast, just nice, slow and controlled motion. You can do that laying down on your back 
And then you can also incorporate ankle movements as you're bending and straightening your knee for an added stretch. Another stretch is a calf stretch. You can do this one when you're sitting or you're standing, and I'm sure everyone has seen a exercise like this or have been told to do something like this. So you can wrap a towel around your toe, pull the foot towards your face, or you can stand next to a wall or a countertop and stretch your calf. And then aerobic training. So focus on low impact options. At home, you can pursue more of the floor bikes, which are pretty inexpensive options. You can use that for either your feet or your arms by putting it on the table. You can use the elliptical, whether that's a recumbent seated option or a standing one. And I love the individuals who have said, I'm taking advantage of the great outdoors. Going outside is gonna be so much more helpful. And also just your well-being of being in the great outdoors is going to be better than on a treadmill. Treadmills don't really care if you're starting to lose your balance. So I, I usually recommend avoiding the treadmill just for safety reasons. I do want you to aim for 30 to 45 minutes of aerobic exercise. And like we said, spread that throughout the day. So three bouts of 10, 15 minutes is going to add up as you do that throughout the day, instead of thinking, I got to do that all at once. And the last area is your core. And so two options for you to incorporate today is a knee press. So laying on the bed, you're just gonna bend your knees. And what you will do is you'll lift your left hand and your left knee, press them together. And you should feel tension in your abdomen develop. And that is like a crunch, but it's much safer as you're not flexing or really cranking on your neck. And then you just repeat on the other side. Modifications, you can perform that even while you're sitting in a chair. So you don't have to be in bed to get a core exercise. And lastly, it's just a straight leg raise. So when you're in bed, have one knee bent, the other leg straight, and you're just gonna slowly lift it up, slowly lower. Modifications, try not to lower the leg to the bed or the ground, try to always keep it suspended in the air. That's going to increase more of a core challenge for yourself. So a la carte, some of those exercises, they sound fun, but really they're not. And I will be very honest, exercise isn't the most fun, but it is more enjoyable, especially when you get to a more group setting. Evidence shows that individuals with peripheral neuropathy if they're engaged in more of an aquatic based program, Pilates, Tai Chi, or yoga, those are all very supported options for exercise and really helpful for individuals with peripheral neuropathy or a gym that offers these. I highly encourage you to pursue, especially once you start feeling comfortable about going into a gym setting in the setting of coronavirus. You can also look online on YouTube. Many different accounts have different adaptive yoga, adaptive Tai Chi or adaptive Pilates. And if you just search, you should be able to find one that could meet you and your needs. But exercise is really just one piece of the puzzle. We know the exercise is very helpful, but it's also how you're treating your body overall. And that's through appropriate nutrition, reducing tobacco and alcohol use, stress management, sleep hygiene, and just encouraging healthy relationships. So if exercise is something that you're feeling really confident in, look elsewhere in your life on where you could optimize to continue to help making you feel the best that you can. So overall, the big picture, like I said, exercise, it's a multifaceted approach. We really want you to have a little bit of everything to get the biggest bang for your buck. Try to have daily flexibility, two to four days of aerobic activity, two to three days of strength training, and sprinkle and balance. Remember, weight bearing is safe. If you do have an open sore or a joint deformity or injury, 
then we want you non-weight bearing and obtain clearance from your medical team before you start pursuing exercise. Apply some maximal exercise principles. Know that moderate intensity is safe and symptoms are your guide. And if you're really still scratching your head as to what's gonna be specific for me, I highly recommend seeking physical therapy consultation for further guidance and recommendations. And you can find a PT by going to www.choosept.com. And I have circled in green, find by specialist, and you can actually specify trying to find more of a neurologic based physical therapist who's going to better understand you, your condition, and all that goes into a peripheral neuropathy. So this is a great website and a great resource, and I highly encourage you to look at it to find someone specific for you. And I like to close just with these two little pictures. A body in motion tends to stay in motion, and life is like riding a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. When we stop moving, that's when you start experiencing more issues. So continuing to find ways to incorporate daily activity, whether that's just what you do in a day or more specific exercises, let's keep that going. Okay, and then these are my references. I'm very sorry, I got a little lengthy, but we have time for questions and Nancy is going to be leading that. And here we are. I think I'm coming back. There we go. Hi, I'm Nancy. And I think Sarah's going to join me just so you can see we are real people. And um, thank you, Sarah. That was really helpful. We've gotten a lot of questions and we'll get to as many as we can. The ones I can't get to, um, I apologize. We'll, we'll see how we can answer them later. Um, I One of the big questions that comes up, Sarah, is there are a lot of people who uh, have numbness or they can't feel their feet or their legs. How do they adjust their, um, their exercise program when you have that numbness or lack of feeling? Great question and something very concerning. Obviously, if you don't have great sensation, you're going to be concerned with how you're exercising. And I, I would say at that point, stick to more seated or laying down exercises because then you're going to have better control, a better visual of what your limbs are doing. When I'm standing, I might not have the best uh, visual of what my feet are doing because then that's going to really impact my posture. So encourage more seated or laying down exercises. And like I said before, stick to bed exercises. Don't try to get down on the ground because that's just cumbersome and could place you more at risk of falling to the ground or falling as you're trying to get back up. If you are an individual who wears an ankle brace, that's gonna help out your ankle stability as you're standing. So if you do have numbness and you have an appropriate device to help support your joints, wear that when you're exercising and then also just body positioning maybe have a family supervise you and you're doing it in front of your bed with your walker or a chair in front and then you can have your family or a friend be right next to you if you're really wanting to do some standing activities and you're concerned about your numbness or other sensory deficits great answer um now people have asked they're just exhausted after they exercise. How do you start? How do you avoid the exhaustion? And is it really good to split it up? And is, does that give your body the same effect? It, it really does. I mean, studies have looked at individuals who exercise for 45 minutes to an hour, but then they're more sedentary the rest of the day. They actually don't have that good of health benefits than someone who tries to just split it up throughout the day and have more frequent bursts of activity and go slow. You know, we all start somewhere. So give yourself grace too of knowing, okay, I, yeah, I'm not going to be able to do 10 minutes all at once. So maybe I just start out with a two to three minute round of seated marches or those seated knee presses like we talked about. 
practice that just twice that day and then just monitor your symptoms. So maybe keep an activity log because that will also help you identify what was too much, what was too little, and what was the Goldilocks just right state. And also know that exercise isn't the only thing depleting your energy. You know, fatigue can also come from emotional fatigue, sleep hygiene fatigue, if you're not fueling your body correctly with the right nutrients. So there's other parts of your life that maybe you could also manipulate to make you have a little bit more of an energy boost. But I do highly encourage just spreading things throughout the day and keeping it manageable, short and sweet initially. As you're going through your exercises, maybe you're progressing in a week and a half to two weeks. You know, when I start exercising, I'm like, oh, yesterday went really well. So today I'll do 15 more repetitions. Don't try to just quickly advance yourself. Give your body time to actually adjust to this increase in activity because your body might adjust a little bit slower. So give it one and a half to two weeks before maybe you add a couple more minutes or a couple more repetitions or a whole new exercise. And then we have people at all ends of the spectrum. We also have some people who are walkers or even runners or want to wear ankle weights and they're afraid they're going to cause nerve damage or make their peripheral neuropathy worse. Can that happen? What do they watch out for? So all I can say is give it a try. It is safe for you to do that. Like I said, everyone is so individual. Someone might not have that capacity to work for 10 minutes versus you might feel like, hey, I could go for 40 minutes and I feel just fine. And that's where it's hard when we have more of these very general descriptions of just monitor your symptoms. They're going to be your guide, but that it is true. You know, as you're exercising with your ankle weights or you are running, you got to just assess how you feel after you exercise that night and the next day. So if you're experiencing this unusual amount of soreness, like, oh my gosh, this soreness is just not going away. I'm trying my stretching. I'm trying maybe some heat or ice packs and it's just lingering. Same thing with fatigue. If I feel exhausted after I exercise, I took an hour nap, let's say, or I just rested for an hour and that didn't restore any energy. Or if I notice I even wake up the next day and I'm still exhausted, then you probably overdid it. Another thing is if you're noticing more muscle cramps or a change in your function. So some people even say, I feel fine after, but I just feel like I'm more incoordinated. I feel like getting up from a chair was much harder than it was before early in the, in the day. The stairs that I do on an every single day basis, all of a sudden it's really hard for me to kind of power through. I feel like I have to pull myself up. Those functional changes mean you did too much in your exercise session. So the next round, don't be alarmed. You're not harming your nerves if you just do that here and there. If you do it more on a consistent basis, then yes, we, we could potentially make weakness worse just because you're never giving your muscles time to replete or restore themselves. Uh, but the next time, just reduce how many repetitions you do, maybe reduce how long of a session you're exercising for, or reducing the amount of weight that you're using. Okay, that's very good. What about swimming? We're all getting to that point where it's summertime. Is that good exercise? Is it safe exercise? And is it safe to do now in this age of COVID or do we not even quite know that yet? <laughs> Don't really know that yet just because you can't have a mask on as you swim. But I know that a lot of pools are having restrictions in place, you know, how many people are in the pool and allowing that social distancing to, to occur. So, you know, do exactly what you feel most comfortable with, um, especially for starting to swim at the pool. If you're at a lake, perfect. You know, there's a lot of space there, but swimming is a very safe and a wonderful option for you, especially if you're more concerned about doing land-based exercises. So whatever you can do on land, 
you can do in the pool because if you start to lose your balance, well, you'll just get a little wet and you don't have to worry so much about your falls or your safety. And pool really has been shown to help with nerve pain just because it's this kind of constant stimulation, which you might be thinking, well, that sounds hor horrifying, but with repetitive stimulation that kind of helps fatigue the, the nerve sensitivity. So it actually lowers some of that buzzing or that uh, burning. And so I really like the pool for an exercise, especially if you feel like that's kind of a big limiting factor for me. One thing with the pool is though, you're gonna feel amazing. It's buoyant, you know, it's very low impact. So I often have a lot of people say, I could spend the whole day in the pool and it just feels great and I'm floating and then I'll tread some water, I'll do some water walking, forward, backward, sidestepping, wonderful. But then they get out of the pool and they're a bag of sand. So they're more tired. So I always say gradually start increasing your time in the pool. So maybe you start with 10, 15 minutes, you get out of the pool. I know it's quite annoying getting in the pool for such a short time, you're getting all wet, but you have to gauge yourself. You have to figure out what's your benchmark of how long you can appropriately be in the pool. But I love the pool, go for it if you feel safe to start going to the pool, especially now in light of COVID. Right. And um, I guess you, you mentioned the uh, recommended aim is, would be 30 minutes a day. Is that correct for exercising? Well, if it's 150 can. minutes per week, you know, so kind of however you want to disseminate that. But usually kind of a good rule of thumb 30 minutes a day of some sort of activity whether that's walking whether that's on your stationary bike or performing some of your exercises but then once again remember what else am i doing in my day that also is encouraging activity so if you're running errands that's another activity we we don't often think of that as exercise but it truly is and so keep that into account if you're like why am i so tired i exercised and i went to target and i went to walmart and i got my hair done and i you know I went somewhere else that all adds up for your energy stores so just remember exercise can just be what you do in a day as well yeah that's great well i think we're just about at the end i guess i'll just leave the last words for you what would you recommend to our audience and, and our listeners uh, to who are starting and wanting to continue their exercise routine? I say choose physical therapy. I mean, we're your cheerleaders. And like I said, really go to that www.choosept.com. There you're gonna be able to locate a physical therapist specific for neurologic based physical therapy. and. I really encourage that just because it does provide some guidance. It's giving you tools for your toolbox and hopefully encouraging more confidence and self-efficacy of, I can do this, I know what I can do and how to monitor because everyone is so different. And if you are just starting, it is nice to have that other accountability buddy to check in on you, make sure that you're doing your exercises correctly and then progressing you as appropriate um, but i just encourage you to just start and remember give yourself grace each day is not going to be perfect we all have shortcomings in our activity and our exercise goals but anything that you do is getting you one step closer to a better you so i just say keep going Great, Sarah, that's very helpful. Um, we had a lot of questions that we may compile and see if we can get some answers, but yeah. to everybody here, I'm sure your, your presentation was useful. And um, I thank you, I thank everyone. And I um, just say that we appreciate you watching. There'll be a survey at the end of this with a couple of questions and you'll be able to tell us what you thought about this presentation. Um, if you like what you saw and would like us to be able to continue to do this, let, please let us know. We 
have a couple of webinars coming up actually. Um, one this month on foot care and one next month on chair, chair yoga. So they fit in kind of nicely with Sarah's presentation. Watch out for those. And if you like us, support us. And if you have any questions, feel free to send them our way. And with that, I will tell everybody thank you and thanks, Sarah, and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone.